I'm going to sort of start by laying out what I think the opportunity is here. Um, this is going to be probably sliding toward the optimistic side of where things go. We do a lot of work that's maybe a little bit more pessimistic sometimes um, or trying to fix problems. This is sort of articulating alternative futures. Um, so just to start, what I'm interested in is how we work together as a community, as a society to achieve our most ambitious collective goals. You know, how are we gonna create the next wonders of the world? Um, and increasingly science says that um, it's not going to be a single individual, you know, in their closet inventing the future, that these things are increasingly gonna require teams, organizations, just groups of people working together. And so any group that comes together is faced with a really, really important question, which is how are we going to organize and coordinate ourselves to do this? And if you're anything like um, any other groups I've, I've experienced, you're gonna have as many different opinions on ans answers to that question as you have people in the room. There is a massive organizational design space of how you coordinate, how you collaborate. Um, and you know, they all are good at in certain situations, but ultimately, um, there's a huge literature that suggests that we as people are really, really bad at making these decisions. And it's not that like, you know, I, I'm sure I, I'm sure we could all like, you know, make fun of business school students who we knew who, who were not quite with it. But, I, you know, it's not that PMs and, and management are, are bad at this. It's just that it's a very, very complex problem space and underdefined and contingent on lots of details of the context and the situation. But the end result is that we're not very good at making decisions about how to organize ourselves to, to do things. And as I mentioned, there's a, this is you know, sort of how life is right now and it was before the pandemic. But one thing that's, I think the pandemic has accentuated is how more and more of these collaborations are getting mediated by computation. That all of that collaboration is happening through a channel uh, where a, some technology is is influencing or at the very least providing the window between which we can we can communicate with each other. And so HCI for a long time has asked this question of how we might design these intermediate channels to be more effective, more fluent, more effect, uh, more powerful, um, et cetera. And so I'm interested in how we can design these mediating channels to help us achieve our collective goals. This is sort of my 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 more precise uh, statement of my animating goal. And most, I guess, here's the launch point for me. We've built a lot of software that helps us collaborate, but it all sort of just assumes that um, everything about the team, the organization, whatever it is, it's just fixed. I'm gonna refer to these as organizational structures or team structures. I'm gonna draw on the organizational behavior literature here in defining this. You can think of, uh, team structures, because we're going to be mostly focusing on teams right now, as sort of like the source code of the team. It's these roles, norms, interaction patterns, the thing that say, this is how this team works, this is how they interact, this, you know, um, it's, it's the thing that tells you what separates this team from a different team. And what kind of is interesting to me is that most of the systems we build take these team structures as totally fixed assumptions. And then you sort of, and then they try to help help us within that set of structures. So just to be concrete about this, Zoom does not say anything about like who should be there or not. It just says, well, there's a bunch of people in a meeting. They're trying to have the meeting that they're trying to have. Let's try to make it smoother. Um, Slack, you know, it basically lets us send messages and emoji, but it's not helping us directly in the, the design of our team structures or organizational structures. It's just sort of, it's a channel through which we chat. GitHub is you know, saying, let's sync code. Asana, let's sync plans. You know, it's, they're all just sort of saying, you all know what you're trying to do. Let's get, out of, let's get out of your way. And I think there are a lot of reasons why that can be a good idea. But at the same time, we can also think about what computation is good at in terms of learning from data, being responsive, being re reactive. And maybe there are opportunities if we are all going to be collaborating through mediated channels like we are now, for computation to aid those structures? Could it help us design our teams? Could it help us uh, evolve and adapt our, our teams and organizations and our collaborations? And could it help us recover when something goes wrong? And I sort of wanted to bring up a couple different examples of this. Um, one of which, uh, the second of which, uh, I think you've, uh, you, you took a, a brief look at 
around helping diagnose problematic starts. And uh, the first of which I'll, I'll talk about also briefly about help, helping us find effective team structures. So I think that's, that's what I'd like to chat about today. I'll, I wanted to start here because I think it sort of lays the groundwork in a maybe a, an even more visceral way than the parallel worlds work about why computation mediating might do things, might make teams look different than they do today. Um, and this comes back to this question that I think we're all very tempted to always ask, which is like, what's the right way to organize a team? Um, every organization relies, you know, uses teams these days. Like, I think one of the major observations was that, you know, while things like micro task crowdsourcing are great when you can sort of write out a recipe of like, do this, then this, then this, then this, and it, it's very structured. Um, most creative work cannot be written out in that style of a recipe. So, and it's optimal to use teams, but then like, you know, should the team be flat or should it be hierarchical? Should we be encouraging, you know, should you all be really nice in your questions to me or should you just be like really mean um, so that we get at the truth or something like this? Should we make sure that we're enforcing turn taking or not? These are all team structures. Again, coming back to that definition, these are, the, these are all the team structures that are influencing how we collaborate. And there's a ton of work, I'm just citing some of it here, where researchers are theorizing these team structures, building systems that nudge teams toward those structures, um, like trying to get people to talk more equally, et cetera. And you know, we're, this is all just trying to push on this notion of like, here's the best way to run a team. We're going to try to get you to do it that way. But it turns out in the social sciences, um, there's, a big, there's a big set of theories that basically say there is no universally ideal set of structures. Um, the, I'm going to build on here something called structural contingency theory, which basically says that the right set of structures for our team depends on who's there and what they're trying to do. If the membership changes or if the task changes, you, you need different answers. So in, in some cases, you need very nimble teams that operate in one way. Another, you know, it could be that if someone else comes and joins the team, you need to adapt your structures around that. So there's no universal answer. And this is problematic because if you use the wrong structures, then the, then the team basically fractures um, and managers who are trained and paid for doing this um, are not ultimately like ideal at this. Like they're, we're far from optimal. So we thought we started thinking about this in terms of whether if these teams, if you know, teams are working together online, could you sort of do rapid self-experimentation? Could you play around with different structures and help teams converge on one that works well for you? Um, so imagine that like you're you're in teams for this for this class. You come you come in. You use our system. You get painted with a particular set of team structures. A different team comes in. Different structures. Different team comes in. A third set of structures yet, and so on. That's the vision here. So let's say that um, you know this thing will all be implemented in Slack. So let's imagine that like there's a team of um, Mark, Asan, and myself. Um, we start collaborating, um, we're doing something and I'm just gonna use like solving some hard puzzle together. Um, and as we go, every once in a while, we're giving feedback to the system of how well we think the team is doing. And based on that, on that feedback, the system is going to actually suggest in sometimes cheeky and sometimes sort of like weird ways. It's like, by the way, I know this sounds silly, but try being really, really positive for the next bit. Try shifting your, your, your norms of interaction to be overly sort of effusively positive. And so here's a set of, of different dimensions and values within those dimensions of team structures that we derive from the organizational behavior literature. You can see it, it deals with like, are we hierarchical? How do we make decisions, et cetera, et cetera. So at the beginning, a team might start out with nothing. We just start working together. And then based on the feedback, the system might suggest a change. Like, oh, by the way, try being explicitly very decentralized in how you make decisions. And again, as we give feedback, the system is nudging these, uh, these structures around until over time we adapt toward a set of structures that work quite well for us. That's the vision. Now, this is, if you, if you have any AI background, you might be thinking of sort of reinforcement learning techniques like multi-armed bandits. Um, that's a great idea. Um, unfortunately, if you have all of these different multi-armed bandits trying to run in parallel, like they're, they're all just trying to explore at once. And it's, it's like what happens if you have an advisor and they get, tell you like 30 things to do um, and then you pay attention to none of them because like it's just too much information all at once. Um, so if everything's changing, then people start ignoring it. 
So we actually ended up developing a variant of a multi-arm bandit here that we call a tempor temporally constrained bandit. Basically just modeling how much change teams are, are open to at a given point. So uh, for example, the behavioral literature says that teams are actually most open to change at the midpoint of their process. Don't change a lot at the beginning, don't change a lot at the end when we're coming up on the deadline, but around the midpoint we're, we're actually pretty open to changes. Um, and certain dimensions are, are better to change early or late. We can model these things and then basically try to say, you know what, Bandit, uh, don't change right now as much. And the way that this basically works without getting too much into the technical details is that we can take this probability of um, sampling each of these arms, each of these options, like are we supposed to be hierarchical or decentralized, um, to basically put the brakes on the, on the, on the uh, chances that we change. Right now, you know, we're in this blue arm, uh, we're likely to change 0.8 probability to one of the other two, and we're just going to, we want it to be that uh, actually most of the probability would be on not changing. So we're just sort of sucking probability away from the, from the other arms. And we can do this um, with math, which I won't get into. But if you do it, you essentially can implement it across all of these bandits uh, in parallel, which means that you can sort of set an expected number, be like change on average one thing per round. Don't get it, you know, don't get ahead of yourself, basically. And I want to demonstrate to you how crazy the outcomes can be if we do this well. So uh, we pulled together a bunch of ad hoc teams off of Amazon Mechanical Turk. If you haven't heard of Amazon Mechanical Turk, um, it's, a, it's an online marketplace where people will do tasks for money. And um, so we can convene groups of these people. We can pay them and generate um, 45 teams. We basically are having them try to solve a bunch of challenging puzzles. Um, if you've ever played code words, it was sort of a variant of that. And we, we give them a, a round to sort of figure it out, a round where nothing's happening, and then 10 rounds in which the, the, the structures can change. And we have three sort of human conditions, one in which there's a manager on the team who's given the same set of structures and options and being like, okay, now let's try this, now let's try this, now let's try this. Two is very like democracy, we're all gonna decide together. Third, going to be a control condition where like whatever, um, you know, we're not saying anything. And then two algorithmic conditions, one in which all the bandits are going wild. Um, and the fifth one in which, as I described to you, we try to put the brakes on it. And what we found was a much larger effect than I was expecting, which was that these teams using uh, the dream team system were outperforming all of the other conditions on the order of 40%. Now, that is a very, that's one of the larger effect sizes I've come across in my career. Um, and basically what happens is that the human conditions, people are risk averse. You may have heard of prospect theory. Um, people basically explore a few things and then say, ah, it's good enough. So we underexplore. Um, in contrast, the algorithms were just trying, like the, the raw search algorithm was trying too many things and people were just ignoring it. And it turned out that sort of finding this, this Goldilocks zone in the middle where we were you know, exploring more than a person normally would, but, um, but not so much that, that they get driven up the wall, ends up having really positive effects if the team goes along with it. There's lots of open questions, like how do we make sure that this feedback is combined equitably? Like how do we make sure that it's not just a manager being like, we're gonna do this now, right? Um, and used against the team rather than in support of it. Um, how, does, how do we adapt when membership changes, when the tasks change over the long term? How might this get integrated in traditional organizations? There's a lot of open questions here. But I just hope the goal here is to sort of open our minds a little bit into the kinds of um, computationally sort of supported collaboration outside of just trying to create tools that are better for us. So I will stop here for just a moment. Um, and if there's chat, uh, our conversation, we can we can do that on this, and then I can we can talk about the parallel worlds, which really built on some of these concepts. Yeah, great, great, uh, you know, very interesting work. One question, Michael. Um, so in this project, the task was pretty much well defined, right? So you need to solve a puzzle, which has a correct answer that you can get closer to. Um, yeah. Do you know about any results when it's open-ended, like generate ideas, creative ideas? So the task itself is open-ended. Uh, would these results still hold? Like, is there any literature on that? Are you aware of it? Sure. So I think open-ended versus closed-ended 
matters less than um, automatically evaluable evaluatable versus not. So the code words, yes, basically we could we sort of get a score. And there are some collaborative tasks where that's possible. Others where you would need to either have an outside expert say, how's it going? Which many organizations already do. You do reviews and so on. Or um, you simply assume that you, you do peer review, you know, trade it with another team and they're reviewing your output and you're reviewing theirs. Um, or you simply go with, ignore the, the performance outcome as we're gonna talk about with the viability stuff going on and, and simply say, hey, team members, how do you think it's going, right? Um, in, basically the trade-off is this, the more, um, the less variance and the more accurate the rewards function is, the more quickly this system will be able to converge on what works well for the team. If there's a lot of variation and things are jumping around and there's more noise and signal, it will take a lot longer. Um, and I have to think about the math in terms of exactly how longer, but it seems like it could be a really big, uh, big hit um, to, to converge. You know, it's just gonna keep, because what it's trying to estimate is like, what's the best combination? And if sometimes it does really well and sometimes it does it really poorly, you need to sort of take an average and you know, the central limit theorem eventually helps you, but like, uh, that, that could take a while if, if there's a lot of variance. Yeah, Michael, why do you think that the middle is when people are the most receptive to changing their strategy as a team? Well, why wouldn't it be the beginning, do you think, like where they haven't even started to work? Uh, right, so the, the behavioral literature, I can try to give a sort of an intuitive, how I reason about it. Okay, so at the end, we it makes sense why it would be potentially problematic, right? If like, you know, a day before a huge deadline, you decide to like fire your advisor and bring in a new advisor or something like that, that's, that's, that could be problematic because you just lose a lot of context. Um, I, I agree that at the, before you start is a good time to, to set uh, structures. These, the, the result was saying more specifically that if you just started and then you immediately change things up, it can be really confusing. Um, and the reason for this is that, so like Tuckman talks about these different stages of, of team evolution. There's forming, storming, norming, uh, where like, you know, we're getting together, we're getting to know each other, we're trying to sort of set the norms of how things go. Um, and then like at some point we're doing stuff. But if we're in the middle of this stage, these stages of like essentially figuring each other out and then things get turned on its head, it basically restarts the entire process um, and it can cause pain and contention. That's my intuitive explanation as to why. Um, I don't actually recall whether the, out, whether the result in that paper or those papers were about impacts on performance or just impacts on um, how much people hated their lives, right? Um, you can imagine if like you just got together with a team, you started interning with a team at Google or something like this and then like, a week later, you get moved on to another team, that would be pretty disruptive. I think that's intuitively what it's capturing. I also see a, a question from, um, I'm, is it Samiha, if, I say, if I'm saying it correctly? Yeah, there's... Um, uh, were people not checking all the possible options because they were uh, Turkers, so didn't want to uh, spend too much time on the task, or was it due to a lack of intuition or expertise? Yeah, so um, the, the, the time they spent on the task was actually fixed, and they were incentivized to do better. So the more, the more, the higher their score, uh, the more, the more bonus we paid them. So, you know, we paid them some baseline amount of fair wage. I don't, it was probably at the time, it was definitely over $10 an hour. Like we try to pay $15 an hour at this point, um, just sort of fight for, fight for 15 oriented. The, um, and so they were incentivized to do well. And it was essentially, they would try a few different things. They were given sort of, you can imagine like a, see, imagine seeing like a list of the things that you should be trying. Um, but it's, it's more that they tried a few things and then sort of said that this is good enough. And you can see this if you look sort of temporally, there's, um, and I think we talk about, we show this maybe in the paper somewhere that like the, um, the changes are, there's a fair number of them initially. And then everyone just sort of like ossifies. Again, it's sort of like you, 
you know, when you get into a new job or you get a new desk, you sort of set yourself up for the, for, and you're sort of adjusting it for a little while, but eventually you just, it, you stop because it's like good enough. Um, there's a term it's called satisficing, um, which is like you're, it's a combination of optimizing and satisfying, like it's good enough. Um, and that's basically it. It's just like, it could, I could do worse if I pick a bad thing and I'm really risk averse. So I don't want to pick the bad thing. Um, so I'm just going to say this thing works well enough. Let's go with it. Um, so they were incentivized to, to pick the best stuff, but they felt that they had picked, found the best thing very quickly. In contrast, we're using the dream team system. Every single one of, I think the 15 teams in that condition wound up with a different, um, a different outcome, like a different set of, uh, of structures. No two teams had exactly the same structures at the end. That was going to be my question. Did you see any patterns or any sort of like themes emerge from, you know, some of the different dimensions and what worked and what didn't work for this specific task? Because understandably, it would be different depending on, like you said, the composition of not only the people, but also the objective of the group. Yeah. So, you know, we had a fixed task, um, which means that I can't really comment on across tasks how it would change. But basically there were a couple, um, here I'll share this, which I'll probably explain it better than I would. Um, there are a couple patterns. One, you can see that these, these two on the right, the, um, this is just a histogram of the number of teams that wound up in, in each value of each dimension. The two on the right had like pretty strong biases toward one or two of the options and like pretty strong biases against a couple of the others. And then the, the three on the left were much more bimodal. Um, so I think I'm, I'm certain that in the literature, they, they actually go into more detail about what are the conditions un, under which each of these is probably a better fit. You can imagine, for example, if you happen to have someone on your team who's like really, um, aggressive and takes them a lot, it's actually beneficial to have a more formalized sort of equal turn taking norm. But if you don't have someone who does that then it's fine to keep it a little bit less, more fluid and probably beneficial. There's a lot of questions that we've been, that we were thinking about around like, did it have to end that way? We've also sort of been on a team or in a group project where at the end of it, it was like, oh man, I really don't want to work with them again. Like I'm, I'm, we did an okay job, but like, holy moly, not never again. You know, we all privately know that like, we're glad it's over. And the question is, you know, if we could rewind time, would we have wound up at the same terrible outcome? Um, so are these terrible team experiences an inevitable destiny? Like given the people in the group and what we were trying to do, was it inevitable that we wound up really disliking each other or disliking working together? Um, and ultimately, you know, are we destined to arrive at these negative outcomes in online collaboration, right? We know that there's a lot of stuff stacked up against us. Um, like the history of CSCW as a field, the early history of it was just essentially a litany of all the ways in which remote interaction amplifies negative dynamics. Um, and, and a lot of that had to do with the fact that um, there were just reduced, reduced uh, cues, right? That we're like not actually face to face. And so, you know, um, my inhibitions are, are, are lesser and then I, I can't see, you know, you can't see me looking sad when you say something mean to me and so on. Uh, we also know that distance matters. This is a classic paper in CSCW basically saying that like, hey, turns out remote software teams um, underperform uh, in-person software teams. I think like the in-person, uh, in, their, in their study, the in-person software teams outperformed the remote ones by a ratio of two to one. Um, and that's, I think, even been replicated uh, somewhat more recently. Um, I'd have to go check my notes from my social computing class at Stanford um, if, if you wanted to hear more about that. But generally, they're, they're, they're pointing out that there's a lot of different intersecting problems that all lead to just coordination, affective, um, conflict, and other challenges that are harder when you're remote than when you're in person. And this is the world we're, li we're all living in now. Distance matters. Um, and if you're in California like me, and you also have to deal with like fires and ash in the sky, like just even being outside is challenging. Um, so today, like you get one shot at it, right? IRL in real life, 
you know, as a team completes its forming and its storming stages, these stages I, I referenced from Tuckman earlier, its dynamics sort of settle in. Like, you know, this is how we're going to interact with each other. Um, if you want sort of an intuitive thought about this, if you've ever gone back and like met up with your friends from high school or your like college, if you're older, again, like the old patterns sort of reemerge. Whoever was like whatever the club leaders, you know, still sort of look to you as the leader and so on. Those dynamics are really hard to change later. Um, but we also know from some, one of my favorite papers of all time by Matt Salganek, Dodds and uh, Duncan Watts is that you have these like very path dependent outcomes based on social influence. So someone might've said something really early on that like where it sounds like, oh my God, Michael's a jerk, right? He makes this attribution that I'm, that I'm not a good person or a good collaborator that I don't trust him or I don't think he's smart. And that, then he reacts in such a way that that, you know, that, that I get, you know, like, wow, he doesn't like me. I guess I don't like him either. And then, and then it just, it goes from there. So you can think of it as like this team's first date can be really consequential, right? It sets up these norms, these expectations, these attributions. And if we screw it up, we're not getting it a second shot. Um, so yeah, that problem the person from high school probably still hates you. Like we only get one shot at this. Um, so this entire effort is basically around this question of whether computation could allow us to reconsider that constraint, right? Can we meet twice for the first time? Um, this is a very dated reference, which dates me, but that's okay. Maybe you understand that like in, in Men in Black, there was a thing and then when it flashed, you, you forgot, yeah, or eternal spots, uh, sunshine of the, of the spotless mind. There are lots of examples of like, what if we could just forget and start over? Um, if we could, then, you know, we could measure, do teams arrive at different outcomes? Could we identify those problematic teams early? Uh, and can we allow teams to restart and retry? And you focused your reading on the third one, which I'll, I'll spend some time talking about. I'll, I'll do a brief overview of the other two just so they all tie together. Um, the big idea behind this is that when you're remote, um, you can pull some interesting, um, some interesting collaboration concepts that wouldn't be possible in person, um, which we refer to as basically bidirectional pseudonym masking, which is three big words. And it's a pretty intuitive concept once I explain it to you, but basically, Let's say, um, and I say, hey, Jaunty Pony, because I see you as Jaunty Pony, gets translated back um, that, that you, uh, that I think you're a little snake, and you say, hey, rapid horse, I say, what are your ideas, and then the name gets changed. Okay, so that's what happens in round one. In round two, um, you still see yourself as rapid horse, but now everyone else sees you by a different name. And likewise, they, um, they still see themselves as bright frog, but everyone else sees them as a different name. The effect of this is that it always looks like you're sticking, you're having the same name, round after round after round after round, I'm still rapid horse. And everyone around me is changing, which makes me think that every new team, every team I'm dealing with is, a, is an actually a new team. When in rea reality, it's, it's your name that's changing. So what happens is that you essentially work with a group of people. Let's imagine that we're all on the blue team. So we interact. Um, and then we all go split up and work with different teams, different members, we sort of mixed up. So some yellow, some purple, some green, some blue. And then when we come back together, we could either be unmasked, in which we see the exact same names we saw before, or we could be masked, which means that we've been randomized to get new names so that even though we're the same people, we think that, they're, that everyone there is different people. And what we wanna do, at least initially, is understand the consistency here, right? So if we didn't like working together the first time, do we like working together the second time, right? Could it have gone another way? And so you, you were interested in viability, right? So team viability is this construct that I think needs to get a lot more attention in the, in the organization's literature. It's basically how well, how much a team would be willing to continue to work together. Like what's their potential for future success? Most of the literature focuses on performance. Like how good are we at getting this stuff done? My claim here is that viability is super important and, un and underemphasized because like highly performant teams can be toxic and they can fracture. Right. If you've um, uh, if you follow like Kahneman and Tversky, very very famous cognitive psychologists, they had like a, they broke up. Like they were a hugely performant uh, duo, um, but then like got it, like eventually could no longer stand to work together. Um, so we are in particularly doing two things. One, we're drawing from a, a scale that's in the literature, a survey that of of I think it's about thirteen questions uh, that we ask each person that basically all ask the different. This, this question about 
uh, the, the capacity for future collaboration in different ways gets averaged together into a viability scale averaged across the members of the team. Poof, we have a number per team on how viable they are. Um, in the context of this first study, we also asked a very binary question. We said, oh, you're going to be uh, pulled together with one of the teams that you worked with before, again, for a final task. Um, if you'd like, you can blacklist one of the, you know, this team you just worked with so that you're not going to be recombined with them again later. And then we, we, we said that if, if at least half of them said, oh, no thanks, I don't want that team again, we marked them as just fully fractured. Their viability was so low, they didn't want to work together again. And so at the... This is what the thing looked like. You know, everyone's in this uh, in this chat environment. Um, we had a bunch of different tasks I'll describe in a moment, uh, but they're brainstorming basically answers to creative questions. Um, and there are these two conditions, masked and unmasked. So everyone's meeting for the first time in that left column. Um, then they're mixing up and meeting people from other teams, and then they're reconvening. And in the masked condition, their names are getting uh, are getting masked so that they can't they don't realize it's the same group. Um, and in the unmasked condition, we bring back the original names and we also, um, I think, show them the past chat transcript of that team and say, oh, it's those, it's those, those folks again. Um, so we also run a manipulation check where we basically say, oh, by the way, afterwards, because this is deception, we say, by the way, two of those teams were the same. Um, here's how we did it. Can you actually guess which of these ones, which of these two teams were the same? And if people could figure it out, then maybe there was some evidence that they uh, that they saw through the, what, what was going on. And so what we need to be able to do is say, how many people guessed that those two, which happened in random orders in practice, um, you can imagine this reconvening one happening second, third, or fourth, um, they should get it right about 17% of the time if they're guessing randomly. So if they're anywhere near that random chance bar, then, um, then, we, then we're thinking that most people couldn't, didn't figure it out, even after we told them. So they were doing these chat-based interactions, teams of three to four, just like before. Um, about half of them were women. Uh, they were pretty short tasks, which I would say is a pretty big shortcoming of this work. Um, you know, 10 minutes at a time, um, but we had to keep it basically under an hour. Um, so they would do all slightly above chance in this experiment that I'm about to describe. And the one that you read, they were like nowhere near that. Um, but generally everyone's doing just about a chance. They're no better than random at figuring out which two teams were actually the same. Um, we have them do three different kinds of tasks, creative and writing tasks or ad writing tasks, where we give them a Kickstarter or an Indiegogo campaign and say, come up with a Google ad that would get people to click on this. So generate like a headline, basically do something creative. Um, and in, an estimation task, these are from different parts of McGrath's tasks are complex, um, and a cognitive conflict task, which basically says it's something like, you know, the city has this much money to allocate, and there are all these different causes, how should they be allocating it? And so what, what happens? So we have a masked and an unmasked condition, and we're measuring what percentage of the time they are consistent in their fracture outcomes. Consistency mean, just means that they said the same thing both times. They loved each other both times or they hated each other both times. Um, so again, this means at least half of them voted to fracture. So if uh, they, they wanted to stay together one time and they didn't the other time, that's inconsistent, that uh, it could have gone another way. So we have these three different tasks. I'm gonna start with the creative one. So when you're unmasked, people are pretty consistent because you, know, you get back together and you're like, oh, these ones again. And so if you liked them, you like them again. If you didn't like them, you didn't like them again. The masked in the creative task, it was a coin flip. Half the time, people changed their fracture outcome. So it's as if it was an entirely new team, which really stunned us. Now, this is only part of the story. It turns out that it's different by task. And we actually still don't even really have a great theory yet as to why but it's polarized. So in this task, it's really polarized towards the coin flip. In the other two, they're much closer to each other. So either it's, again, without knowing it, they're very consistent, or without knowing it, they're very inconsistent. But the, so far, we have not observed any tasks for which there's a middle ground. Um, so I what, I what I would say out of this is that this consistency is very polarized. Now, the second piece of this, which is just about to appear at CSCW in a couple of weeks is, can we classify this? If we apply machine learning tools, can we you know, start to say, 
can we identify which teams are, are the most viable or you know, sort of do a median split or the most problematic? Um, so this is what those viability scales look like if you just sort of take a histogram of it. So they sort of center, you know, sort of roughly normal. And what we want to be able to do is say, can we identify, you know, the top, the top 10%, the, the teams that are really doing well, or the bottom 10%, the teams that are really problematic, things like this. Um, I won't go into really very many details here. Uh, we used a bunch of computationally derived features inspired by the by the orgs and social psych literature, uh, turn taking dispersed markers, message counts, stuff from Luke, um, basically things that you can get out of NLP. Um, and then also from the organization's literature, we had people manually label things like use of sarcasm, playful language, political discussion, social loafing, frustration, things that are maybe higher level concepts that an algorithm isn't so good at picking up on yet. And we um, put these 600 or so transcripts into uh, there. We did a bunch of different models. It turns out logistic regression is a pretty, pretty dang awesome one for something of this uh, size. Usually you can get like 90% of your of your ultimate accuracy out of like a logistic regression or a, or a naive Bayes. And then the rest, you can, if you want more, you can go to a, go to a deep net. Um, and what we find is that there's about a 0.92 AUC at identifying the top 10% of teams. So the most highly viable teams we can uh, we can classify fairly accurately. Um, now, every it seems like the these most viable teams are doing things that are consistently different from everyone else because you can see that the numbers are pretty stubbornly around 0.75 for everything else, um, which is not terrible but also not not fantastic. Um, but another thing we found in sort of a, a thin slices style is that we only needed the first 70 seconds, that's like 12 or 14% of, of the interaction in order to get this accuracy. So we could cut out most of the team's interaction, only look at the very beginning and have pretty dang awesome prediction. Um, so whatever's happening, those signals tend to be clear from the very beginning. So actually, you know what? I really don't like how this talk's going. Can we just, can we just start over? Anyway, so this is sort of what, what you actually read about. Uh, could we actually start over? And this is where we picked this up. We said, could we turn this from an experimental scaffold into a design intervention? Imagine that we were doing this team dating thing like uh, uh, Lorenza Cow and, and, and her colleagues uh, started thinking about this, like meet a bunch of different teams. You're, you know, we're about to work on a project. You meet a bunch of different possible teams. Um, and then you pick the one you like at the end. What if, um, as we were doing with that, we actually met the same team multiple times along the way, creating different parallel worlds, right? So like you're, you've got some infinity stones or something like this, and you can just go into the, into the time stream, try again. And then we're just gonna sort of keep the one that worked the best. If we know that sometimes teams do well and sometimes they don't, and it seems like it's a little bit random how it winds up, what if we could just like help the teams uh, start off on the right foot. So, you know, imagine we're meeting, we meet again, but with new identities, we meet again, again, with new identities. Again, eventually, um, we bring back the one with the purple hats and said, hey, it's these people, remember them? You liked working with them. Um, and we can sort of mix that up with other teams as well. In this experiment, we were just having the same team interact five times. Again, they didn't know this at the time. Um, and this is what you read, so I won't go into too much detail, but if you look at this viability and uh, you look at the best initial round, they did, uh, you know, this is how viable they were. Median round was below that. And the, uh, the reconvened round where we brought back that most viable, that best initial round was about as good as the best initial round. So it's like nearly a full standard deviation, 0.87, uh, better than just taking sort of the median. So they're like really getting off to a substantially better foot. Like this is a large effect size in a, in, a, um, in, a, in any sort of behavioral context. So there's a lot of implications and risks here. Like when should and shouldn't we be able to start over, right? There are some things that like you should not be able to just rewind and try again. Like where it might be putting a, a low status individual in the team at risk. What if someone gets harassed? Should we just be able to like, bring people back with like the same team with their harasser without them knowing it, that seems extremely problematic, right? So if you were ever gonna deploy this, you'd need to be able to give people the ability to say, nope, and like hit the red button and, and make sure that they're in control of that kind of thing. Um, I also think that it, in, in order to do this ethically, you need notification and consent, um, like in team dating. So if we know up front that we're gonna be meeting a bunch of different teams and sometimes we're gonna meet the same team different times just to sort of see how things go, then I think we're okay. If everyone knows this and everyone uh, is okay with it, then I think we're okay. But if you're instead just trying to like, you know, fix something behind the scenes, if you're gonna be this Dienta, 
um, I think that starts to become ethically much more problematic. So just to close, um, you know, a lot of the future of work kind of discussions end up talking about how work it can, you know, thinking, you know, how can we bring algorithms into this? I, I think differently about this. I think, how would we design to augment the organizational structures that we design in these, in these organizations today? How could we use computation to make ourselves smarter rather than replace ourselves? Um, in fact, organizations, when they originally came up around the, the rise of the railroad and the industrial revolution, they were designed after a mechanical metaphor. The, the designers, the, the people who thought about this at the time looked around at the most advanced technology they had, which was um, like mechanical gears interlocking. And they were like, oh, we want people to, to work together as effectively as gears uh, work together in a system. And I think in that time, computation has gone from a dream of Charles Babbage to something I wear on my watch. So I feel like maybe we're due a bit more of a, uh, of a reconsideration of those, of those structures and how we assume they should work. So I'll stop there. Um, we can chat much more about it, but I wanted to give shout outs to students who I worked with on this, Sharon Hunchang and Mark, um, and my colleague, Melissa Valentine, who's an organizational behavior scholar and funders and so on. So yeah, um, we have some time we can chat more. Um, I'd love to hear your feedback. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. I'm sure um, people have questions. Yeah, there's one in the chat about why do this sort of two, like sort of those, this like, more complex pseudonym dance, um, as opposed to just re-randomizing everyone. I think the part of this is that if I see my name consistent, then I like sort of associate my, I don't as immediately assume that the people I'm meeting with are probably the same people as before. That was the, that was the short version. That if, um, that if I see my name changing every time too, I might be like, oh, well then that's, it becomes a more obvious and B it also gets very complicated because then you don't know when someone's referring to you. If my name's always changing, then um, they're having all these conversations every 10 minutes. It was just, there's also a usability goal there. Of just like <laughs> cool it um, so that you can keep track of your own username. Uh, I have a question in terms of like deployment of the system in the real world. So like, um, let's say, uh, let's say, we're, we had one team in which everybody had a bad interaction, but then you had another iteration with the same team, but different names, and they somehow had a really good interaction, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And at the end, uh, you're telling them, oh, you were the same team, uh, but in the second iteration, you had a much better viability, so we would like you to work together. Um, wouldn't people still, like, um, I guess, like, hold some grudges from the first interaction? I think it depends on how everyone um, decides to do it. So, for example, one way to do this is to say, you know, you met together a bunch of times. Here's all the times you met together. Another one is to sort of, another option is to let the others be water under the bridge and say, um, this is that team. And we don't tell you about the other times that you met. So, um, there are risks there, right? Again, what if someone has a bad side that you just didn't see that time and you should have, and maybe you can make a better, um, more considered judgment if you had. But at the same time, if you believe the literature that sometimes these things are accidental first steps that like they essentially are effectively random, then I feel like it's a little bit more okay to say, you know, oh, here's a group that you got along with. And I think basically what you want to do is remove the possibility that there's actually a, a, a real problem there. So give people the ability to veto a team. That was especially problematic. But when in reality, what happens is that sometimes it's that, you know, the team goes between like fine and great. And you want to go with the great version of it. That makes sense. I'm wondering if you know out of what percentage of these interactions was the very first time that the team met the best version of that team, the most viable that that team was? We have that data. I don't know that I know the answer off the top of my head. What I can tell you is that we looked for learning effects over time. That is to say, did teams like each other more on average as they got further through the experiments? Um, I don't think that was the case. Um, no, yeah, I, I can show you, like, I have a backup slide about that, but no, they, they basically fracture at the same rate across all the rounds. So it's not like people are um, 
starting nicer and getting meaner or vice versa on average. Because like so what that suggests to me is that it's pretty equally distributed. Um, because wouldn't you say that there is some sort of dependency that exists, just the fact that you're doing the same task successive rounds in a row and that maybe you get better at doing the task and perhaps later on in these rounds, other people also got better at doing the task and they're like, oh, wow, look at us. We're doing really well at this task now. Um, this is the most viable team. And it's actually a function of there is these dependencies that exist between the successive rounds and viability. Right. And not, not only that, but there might be team learning that occurs where I become, I learn how to be a better collaborator over time, right? I see bad things happen. I see good things happen. I, I apply lessons. So we didn't observe that. It, it's like, it seems intuitive that that should happen, but it seems like it was a more minimal effect um, that, that there were pretty strong personal attributions being like, well, I don't want to work with them again, or yeah, they seemed awesome. Um, in, the, in the prediction paper, we started talking about what are the kinds of things that were particularly predictive. Um, and they tended to be things, in fact, the computational features um, had like the same accuracy as if by themselves if we dropped the human ones, which means that this could be deployed as sort of an early warning system with no human intervention. Um, and there was a lot of looking at the sort of tone and depth of the discussion. That was what seemed to matter. If people were um, sort of not engaging, that was a that was a pretty clear negative sign. And if they were, you know, really digging into it, then it was very positive. And that seemed to matter more than than the task learning. I have a question. I have a question. Yeah. Michael, have you considered probing more into race or gender by mixing those identity and see what happens in a team? And yeah, so, so I think my thoughts on it that we would need to collaborate with sociologists to make sure we, we do this correctly. Um, but so there, um, yes, so there is a bunch of theory and prior empirical work um, on what's called status characteristic theory, I believe. Um, that suggests that when certain status characteristics like race that tend to be associated with status um, are made salient or clear, then, then they have impacts, right, on the kinds of interactions people will have. So you can imagine masking some of those. Um, what we've been doing actually is asking that consistency question of status. So we have some pilot results asking the question of, if you were to bring this team together again together from scratch, is the same person end up being the leader or the high status individual, right? So if there were like 10 of us and we were all collaborating, what percentage of the time does ASON end up being the one who everyone looks up to, right? That's what we're looking at. Um, and then it's clearly influenced by these status characteristics, right? You can imagine running that as a, also manipulating, you know, our, you know, do we make, do we manipulate ASAN's perceived gender or something like this? Um, and what's the fixed effect of that? So you can, you can do these things in virtual experiments that are a little harder to do in person. Any I, last I, question for Michael? Yeah, go ahead, Aaron. I have a quick question. Just um, one of the things that struck me about the paper that we read was um, ultimately you concluded that viability as you define it was not predictive of success as you defined it, um, which was I think like the Google ads um, or the Kickstarter campaign and how successful it was. And obviously that's not, um, you know, I guess a, um, a super easy thing to measure, but I, I'm curious your thoughts on the connection between viability and success. I mean, you, men you mentioned that maybe sometimes as organizations, we focus too much on success and not viability, but ultimately, um, the objective of an organization is success. And I think viability is definitely one component, but I can think of organizations, you know, say the New York Yankees or like the prop trading desk at Goldman Sachs, like they don't care what players are in there. They just care about the outcome and the success. So I'm just curious kind of in all the work you've done, how do you relate viability to success? Yeah, well, I think my claim would be that ultimately I guess that viability is a requirement in many situations for long-term or sustained success. 
So I think it's possible to have like a shine, shine brightly and then like go supernova explode and you can never do it again. Um, but ultimately an organization that doesn't have substantial viability will shed employees, right? People are gonna leave. Uh, they, don't, they don't feel, uh, you can look into the literature on psychological safety, for example, they don't feel like they can take risks or they don't feel respected in, in the space. Um, and so, yeah, in, in our situation, it's, it's, so it's clear, okay, another example, I'm sure we can all think of examples where there was like a group that in, you know, high school or college or whatever, the group projects were like, everyone seemed to be having a great time, but they did a terrible project, right? That was a team that was highly viable, but not very performance. Um, and I think, you know, I also gave examples of like the highly performant, but not viable teams. And I think all I'm, I'm merely trying to point out that like, you probably want both. Um, and if you, op if you only optimize one, you might end up sacrificing the other. This is why social networks like Facebook really struggled for a while because they had organized their optimization objective around engagement signals like likes, clicks, and comments. Um, not thinking about sort of the long-term viability and mental health of, of the community. And they had to come back around later and say, well, actually we want to, you know, to be supporting the, the, the development of strong ties and mental health. And like this changed what was ranked highly in the feed, right? But they had to come back around later because they had done the wrong kind of optimization hacking, reward shaping. Um, so that's sort of roughly how I think about it is that, you know, each organization might have a different mix of viability and, and performance that it cares about. Like sometimes you might want a team of rivals, um, but ultimately I think you want to be considering them both with, you know, as with some alpha parameter, right? Consider them equally, consider one more than the other, at least just like make a decision and be transparent about it.